Good morning. I'm pleasantly surprised. I figured being the first speaking slot today, I'd have like 10 science nerds interested in forensic science. It's really cool to see so many people here. Um, the title of my talk today is Taking the Science Out of Forensic Science. I am not the one recommending taking science out of forensic science that's being done by other people a lot higher up the food chain than I am, which is why I'm doing this talk today. Uh, my name is Kathleen Johnson. I'm currently Vice President and Military Director of American Atheists, and I thank you so much for being here to hear my talk because I feel it's important what I'm going to talk about today. Usually when I'm tasked to talk, my talks pertain to the state of atheism and secularism within the military, but today I'm going in a different direction. Besides my work in and for the military, I've been working in the fields of investigative forensics and crime analysis for more than 30 years, long before investigative forensics was a thing that the public is so familiar with today. My experience predates modern forensic techniques, including DNA, and I've had to work very hard to keep my knowledge relevant as these sciences have developed and evolved. I have a master's degree in forensic science from the University of Florida, and like you read in my bio, I teach uh, undergraduate investigative forensics as an associate professor part-time while maintaining full-time employment in the overlapping fields of forensics and analysis. I was also in the military. I'm not 100 years old. All these things took place concurrently. I, my law enforcement experience was within, uh, was within the, the military, uh, and still is. I still work for the Department of the Army. Um, the scientific debate that has been at the forefront of the news, at least the news sources that aren't fake, is climate science and the fact that the current administration is filled with climate change deniers. There's other attacks on science, of course, going on, like, like the war on women's reproductive rights and more types of science than, than, than is appropriate. Climate change, however, is not the only front for the current administration's war on science. One war on science that has been overlooked is Jeff Sessions' war on the forensic sciences, specifically on efforts to ensure scientific credibility within the forensic sciences so that persons aren't wrongfully convicted based upon testimony derived from junk and discredited forensic science disciplines. Let's see if this works. Oh, apparently it's working too well. I didn't realize that was going on. Let's back up, okay. I like this one, this little cartoon. Hey, we got a match. <laughs> All right. In 2013, under the previous administration, the Department of Justice established the National Commission on Forensic Sciences in partnership with the National Institutes of Standards and Technology to evaluate the forensic sciences with a goal of enhancing their practice and improving their reliability. The statement that I just read is, par is a paraphrased quote from the now archived website at www.justice.gov slash archives slash NCFS. The council was divided into several specialized subcommittees, accreditation and proficiency testing, which is the committee that's set up to make sure uh, crime analysis laboratories are, are standardized and they meet uh, established levels of performance. Uh, human factors, which forensic sciences are as much sometimes an art as a science, and there's room for uh, improving the human factors involved because humans are prone to making mistakes. In terms of solutions, the council was set up to recommend um, temporary fixes until more permanent fixes could be set up. Medical legal death investigations. This is the autopsy and forensic pathology side of, uh, of forensics. Reporting and testimony, that's the courtroom side of things. Scientific inquiry and research, that's researching the scientific validity of things, which is what I'm going to be talking about. And training on science and law. Each subcommittee was tasked with identifying uh, excuse me, each uh, subcommittee was tasked with identifying issues, developing solutions, and making recommendations for improvements in each of these specialized areas. As identified on the archived website and in their final product, which is very awkwardly titled, Reflecting Back, Looking Towards the Future, published 11 April 2017, the council had several objectives and defined the scope of their activities. All right, those... Uh, the objectives and scope directed the commission to provide recommendations and advice to the Department of Justice concerning national methods and strategies for these things. Strengthen the validity and reliability of the forensic sciences. That's the science side. 
enhancing quality insurance and quality control, making sure laboratories are, are testing consistently and scientifically and doing what they're supposed to be doing, identifying a recommended scientific guidance and protocols for these hosts of things, including evidence seizure, which is my particular specialty, and identifying and assessing other needs of the forensic science communities to strengthen their, their uh, disciplines. Um, what they're talking about here in this one is the, maybe some of you are familiar with it, the issue with, uh, with uh, testing backlogs in crime labs, particularly with, with, with uh, DNA testing and rape kits and things like that. There, there, are, there are states in the country now where they have untested lab rape kits that, that have been sitting there for 20 years. That's horrifying. That's what this particular recommendation was going to help address. During the first couple of years of its existence, the National Commission on Forensic Science published numerous findings and recommendations that had the capability to greatly improve the science side of forensic sciences. Honestly, I believe their work was stunningly important, and I have to retrain, restrain myself from going over every report in detail, um, but as the subcommittees were quite prolific, they did 43 separate reports in the short time that they, uh, short time that they existed. We would be here through the eclipse and beyond. We would miss our flights. And uh, the organizers would not thank me if I put us behind schedule on eclipse day, because it's not like we have something important to do later today. So, so I'm going to try to stay on schedule. Another cartoon. I like forensic cartoons. <laughs> it's the peas porridge. All right. <laughs> you see those. On uh, April 23rd, 2017, our current Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, intentionally, intentionally, and with forethought, allowed the organization's charter to expire. Um, for this next session, I'm going to be heavily, heavily referencing and quoting a Washington Post article by Radley Balco that was published on April 11th, 2017, as Mr. Balco is a much better writer than I am, and he neatly highlights Mr. Sessions' mindset with regards to this commission and the forensic sciences in general. That's the first part of the article. I know some of you can't see the slides, so, and I know you can read it for yourself, but I'm going to read it anyway. Um, please note that according to this article, Mr. Sessions personally attended hearings that described how junk forensics has led to wrongful convictions. Uh, convictions. This is from the article. When Jeff Sessions was a senator on the Senate Judiciary Committee, he was part of hearings to address the National Academy of Sciences report on the use of forensics in America's courtrooms. The NAS report had been commissioned by Congress after DNA testing had revealed that not only hundreds of people had been wrongly convicted of serious crimes like murder and rape, but also that about half those people had been convicted due in part because of forensic testimony that could only have been wrong. This is the second part of it. Sessions wasn't buying it. I don't think we should suggest that these proven scientific principles that we've been using for decades are somehow uncertain and leaving prosecutors having to fend off challenges on the most basic issues in a trial, he said, rebutting the scientists who had come to precisely that conclusion in their report. The scientific and proven parts were precisely what the report found lacking in too many forensic disciplines. Sessions either didn't read it, he has a record of criticizing reports without reading him, or he simply dismissed it. Continuing to quote, when witnesses noted there was no scientific research to support the field of handwriting analysis, Sessions remarked, well, I've seen them testify, and I've seen blow-ups of the handwriting, and it's pretty impressive. Who are you going to believe, a team of scientists or Jeff Sessions' sense of wonder? <laughs> Reading the article, you can see that Mr. Sessions reportedly dismissed the need for scientific testing the accuracy and validity of handwriting analysis techniques based upon his personal experience of courtroom presentations that impressed him. That is the heart of the problem. Courtroom presentations can be very impressive and very deceptive. Um, he's fooled. He's the top of the Department of Justice. You can imagine what you know, a jury is going to think in Mississippi or something, how easily they can be influenced by, by junk science. Since uh, this article specifically references handwriting analysis, this is something I will briefly address right now. 
In forensics, handwriting analysis pertains to using handwriting samples to identify the person who wrote a question document by making physical comparisons between the samples under the theory that a person's handwriting is unique. This is distinct from that other type of handwriting analysis. It's also sometimes called graphology, which claims your handwriting can reveal your personality traits. The difference here is as distinct as the difference between astronomy and astrology, astrology meaning one of the two is bunk. And perhaps the other one is too. All right. This is a sample of graphology, also called handwriting uh, analysis. Notice, notice the notes. Um, around the borders that point out different uh, characteristics of the handwriting and claim they can, they can tell things like whether or not you're unhappy about your divorce or you know something along those lines from uh, the characteristics of your handwriting. Uh, the kind of um, sample that Jeff Sessions was talking about looks more like this. This is more like something somebody might see in a courtroom with uh, terminology differs between departments and between labs, but I think what they were looking at on this slide, the Q means the question document, which is the, the allegedly forged sig signature, and the S refers to a sample that was collected to be compared to uh, the question document. Uh, usually in handwriting analysis, at least, in, at least in my agency, you collect three things. You have the question document, you collect handwriting exemplars, which are fresh samples from the person you suspect of authoring the question document, and then you collect something we call standards, which are known handwritings of the previously produced known handwritings of the person. And these three things get compared to determine if there is a match. Unlike the impression that Mr. Sessions allegedly came away with in court, even if scientifically valid, handwriting analysis is far from a clean, precise science. For example, when someone is forging a document, it is common for them to execute the forgery using means intended to disguise their handwriting, such as writing with their weak hand. Plus, it is known that the writings can be altered by simple things like standing up versus uh, sitting down at the time the question document is authored. When an investigator is trying to collect handwriting samples or exemplars from a suspect, the investigator must try to duplicate the original authorship conditions as much as reasonably possible. We used to see this a lot when, in the days when check forgeries were a thing. They're not so much a thing anymore, but, but they used to be very common. And somebody would be standing at a, like a bank counter and they'd be standing to do the signature forgery. So you would take your handwriting samples uh, uh, standing up. Mr. Sessions, who is not a scientist, supports the idea that uh, scientifically testing this concept of handwriting analysis is not necessary. And the thing is, the, the witnesses who noticed there was no scientific research to support the validity of handwriting analysis was not claiming that the science was invalid, just that it was untested to rigorous scientific standards, which is a flaw that applies to other forensic sciences as well. Sessions is saying there's no need for further testing. I like that cartoon too. I had somebody ask me yesterday why uh, chalk drawings are a, are a thing. They're not, chalk drawings are not so much a thing anymore because we do a lot of digital imaging and things like that now, but I like the cartoon. In the next session, I'm gonna briefly mention drug testing. And when I do, know that I'm discussing the science of the test, not the ethics of the test, not on the current movements in states to legalize things the federal government still deems illegal. I think a whole lot of things that are illegal should be legal. Um, I'm just talking about the science. Many of you might be surprised to know that according to the National Academies of Sciences in, in 2012, only DNA testing had been rigorous, rigorously studied and peer reviewed. Additionally, other fields that fall under the umbrella of forensic science, such as forensic drug chemistry and forensic toxicology, although not endorsed by the National Academy of Sciences, um, have been mostly validated through testing and applications from within and outside the forensic science field, and are thus considered mostly reasonably reliable, although there are some instances of some substances resulting in false positives or false negatives regarding urine tests for drugs. And it's for these reasons I believe the National Academy of Science did not include these fields in their endorsement. Uh, some of you might find this next piece uh, surprising. Fingerprint matching has been used as a crime solving tool since the 1800s and yet as of 2012 was not validated using commonly understood scientific standards and principles. 
And there are no currently rigorous, scientifically rigorous studies that have been confirmed that show fingerprints are unique enough that persons can be identified from full or partial prints to the exclusion of everyone else. It is my understanding that there are some studies being done. But it's also my understanding that some of these studies are already determining that fingerprint matching may be influenced by things like institutional bias. For example, examiners that work for labs that work directly for police agencies may feel pressure to make matches. All right, forensics on trial. This slide is from a website that is deriding the fact that forensics are on trial. However, I submit, as a scientist who is committed to justice, not case solve rates, Forensics is in no way a true science unless it's subjected to rigorous and peer-reviewed scientific testing. So yes, forensics should be on trial just like any other scientific discipline. And this slide does have the, the drug chemistry and, and for, it's got everything on there except DNA. Um, this slide also includes fire science, which people don't realize is part of the forensic sciences, but, but it is, as for determining arson. Um, there's a particularly egregious example pertaining to fire science that, that we're gonna talk about in a minute. The case studies that I will show you as we progress through this presentation are primarily drawn from a report by Jonathan Jones for the PBS program Frontline titled Forensic Tools, What's Reliable and What's Not So Scientific, and from the Internet Archives of the Innocence Project. But there are hundreds of legitimate references I could have drawn from to illustrate the scope of this problem. We're going to do a case study. I chose the following example, even though it's a little old, I chose the following example because in light of the recent terrorist attacks that just happened in Spain, I thought spotlighting this particular incident as representative of the larger problem of forensics being badly misused seems more timely than ever. This is Brandon Mayfield. He is a Muslim lawyer, a convert, who was once accused of being the Madrid train bomber in, 20, in 2004. He was identified on the basis of a fingerprint match by multiple examiners, multiple examiners at the FBI, and was subsequently arrested and held for more than two weeks. He vigorously defended himself and was eventually awarded a $2 million settlement. Uh, that's a sample off the internet, of course, because everything's on the internet, that supposedly the prints that were used uh, for the comparison. The reason his uh, prints were on file is because at one time, he enlisted in the service. He served a few years in the military, and they collect your prints when you, when you come into the service. So that's where the original print came from. As this investigation was being conducted, and as the FBI announced the arrest of this person and commenced to spying on his family and dismantling his life, investigators in Spain were notifying the U.S. that their investigators strongly contested this identification, and that they had used fingerprint evidence, the same fingerprint evidence, to identify their own suspect who was eventually corroborated through other means as the likely suspect in the bombing. Multiple examiners in the U.S. had looked at these fingerprints and validated Mr. Mayfield as their suspect, and they were all wrong. One of the problems with fingerprint analysis, along with some of the other forensic sciences, is that the results might be subject to some internal biases, either on the part of the examiners or institutional biases on the part of the organization the examiners work for. In this case, he was Muslim. Americans wanted to get the big solve. They wanted to pin it on a, they liked the idea of pinning it on a, on a Muslim. And, and this guy was basically, and his family was basically dragged through hell. Yeah, so I like this cartoon because it's, <laughs> it's about this particular case. <laughs> As of 20, uh, 2014, according to multiple references, more than 250 persons who were convicted of crimes because of junk forensics were exonerated through DNA testing sponsored by the Innocence Project and other organizations devoted to justice. Hair analysis, which is the comparison of hair left at a scene compared to hair extracted from a suspect, and bite mark analysis, which is the comparison of bite marks left on something, such as a victim, and a, scast, and a cast of the bite of the suspect are notoriously known in ethical forensic science circles to be unreliable, and there have been no studies that show a particular bite pattern or a particular hair match identifies someone to the exclusion of every other person. But yet, that is what has been testified to, and people have gone to jail for decades because of it. Um, and some of these people have later been cleared through, cleared through DNA testing and other, other methods. 
little hair analysis for you. In uh, 2013, a man named Michael Cristini was awarded $1.5 million from the city of Detroit after being cleared of rape charges after serving 13 years in prison for a rape he did not commit. He was convicted on the basis of bite mark matching evidence, even though he had a solid and confirmable alibi that he was out of the state at the time of the rape. He was cleared when the bite mark evidence which resulted in his conviction was challenged and determined to be faulty. This slide is off the Innocence Project website. And uh, these are people who were recently cleared, uh, usually because DNA testing cleared them, not always, but usually because DNA cl uh, testing cleared them. Uh, I won't tell all their stories, but I encourage you to read about these injustices on the Innocent Project website, and I will highlight a few of them. The stories I'm going into right now were uh, convicted on the basis of faulty investigative techniques, such as, oh, th sorry, uh, these stories I'm going into were not convicted on the basis of other uh, faulty investigative techniques, such as bad eyewitness identification, which is problematic, and, um, and being psychologically pressured or mentally coerced into making false confessions, which is another, another problem, uh, either of which would make a great subject for a future talk, but we don't have time to do that today. Um, talk briefly about William Barnhouse. He served 25 years for a rape he did not commit. commit. 25 years. He was convicted on the basis of a faulty eyewitness identification and on a hair match in which the testimony associated with that match was intentionally exaggerated to give the jury the idea that a hair match means a, person's ma a person match. It does not. Uh, another person on this slide, Timothy Bridges, also served 25 years for a rape he did not commit and he was convicted almost entirely on the false testimony by a lab technician who claimed two of his hairs were found at the crime scene. This case is a bit unusual in that he was not cleared because of DNA testing. He was cleared because the hair matching analysis used to convict him was determined to be both faulty and fabricated. In 2015, the Innocence Project and other organizations pressured the FBI to conduct an audit of cases in which lab examiners provided testimony pertaining to microscopic hair analysis. Of the 268 cases reviewed, the testimony in 257 of those cases was determined to be scientifically invalid. That's a stunning result of 96% of the cases in which microscopic hair examiners rendered testimony was determined to be misleading at best and outright false at worst. This slide is a joke about misusing forensic science. In this case, for some minimal personal gain, like knowing who's stealing your, fridge out of, your lunch out of the fridge, because that's a thing and it happens. Um, so this is, you know, it's personal gain, it's funny. But the situation of forensic sciences being used to send innocent people to prison is decidedly not funny. It's a travesty. Through Mr. Sessions' actions and current position of the Department of Justice on a variety of issues, in my opinion, Mr. Sessions has declared that he, and by extension the Justice Department, are just fine with the forensic sciences remaining, at least in part, among the sciences that I, a fact-finding skeptic who cares about justice, consider to be junk science. And the consequences of his position are severe for hundreds, if not thousands, of people. So what do we do? What happens now? Like many other things involving our federal government now, some of which have been discussed at this conference at some, some length, our options are limited at the federal level. Our best chances for success under this administration right now are at the state level. Some states, including somewhat surprisingly my own state of Texas, uh, have established their own commissions to do things at the state level that the National Commission was trying to do at the federal level. This particular commission, again somewhat surprisingly, is supported by our conservative Republican governor, Governor Abbott. Texas, um, and Texas, Texas has been the site of some pretty egregious problems because of this. Texas was the site, Texas, Texas is where uh, we executed a father of three um, who was convicted of setting the fire that killed his three daughters based entirely on now discredited and false junk science. The fire was an accident and we executed somebody because of that. Um, 
the consequences are, are tremendous. That's why Texas takes an interest in this. There uh, may be a commission in your state, which if you're interested in researching this topic, your, your state government websites might be a place to start. My purpose in giving this talk is to make you aware of a problem that is mostly invisible unless it directly affects someone in your own circle of associates. I want to introduce the idea that forensic science should be viewed with a skeptical eye, that we must apply our critical thinking skills to scientific reports and testimony, especially when we serve on juries, and that we need to pay attention to news reports about laboratory misconduct and testing backlogs and understand that real people, innocent people, are being harmed. I must also point out that the fact that the flaws in the criminal justice system, including but not limited to forensics, fall disproportionately heavy on people of color. Are there white victims? Absolutely. Uh, there were white people among my examples, and the father of three that was executed in Texas, wrongfully executed in Texas, is white. But it's undeniable that the heavy hand of so-called justice falls heavier on black and brown people, and that they are arrested more often than white people and are treated more harshly due to the systematic racism built into the system and the institutionalized white privilege that allows some of us to be blinded to this racism. Most of you in this audience are white, as am I, and that increases the odd that this and other problems within the justice system don't directly affect you. When you serve on juries, the odds favor the likelihood that the defendant will be black or brown and that, you, and that problematic forensics may be deployed against him or her. A couple of days ago, you heard Nick Fish mention Saturday that efforts to repeal the Johnson Amendment are a solution in search of a non-existent problem. This problem is the exact opposite. It's a real problem in search of a solution, which I don't have today. But the first step to finding a solution is to spread awareness of the problem among ethical, logical, enlightened, and politically active people like us. Thank you for your time and attention. I think I have a few minutes. Well, actually, I'm at the end of my time. Do we have time for a question or two? We've got time for a couple of questions, if you have a couple of questions. Thank you. Question. Okay. So my question is if we ever are selected for a jury or we're ever called for jury duty, I have heard, and I don't know if it's accurate, that. They don't want people who are you know, well-educated and intelligent. So, I mean, how do you get yourself approved for jury duty? Yeah, so can... it, most people, when they, when they report for jury duty, all they're thinking about is trying to get out of jury duty, um, which is which usually thinking intelligent people usually can articulate their way out of a jury faster than, than, than other people. And I submit, you can serve on a jury. Just don't try to get yourself out of the jury. Um, you got to do it. You gotta do it. Innocent people go to, go to jail. If you're called to serve on a jury, chances are you can get on a jury. Uh, unless, unless you have a master's degree in forensic science and have worked in criminal justice. I've never served on a jury. I get tossed out every time I go to, go to jury duty. But, but smart people can get on juries and we should get on juries. We have one in here in the back. What are they doing in Alabama now? Or is uh, what sessions? You're talking about sessions, so what are they doing now since he's out of Alabama? Uh, I don't know anything particular about the specific state of Alabama, just, uh, just federally and then in my own state of, of Texas. Okay, to your left. First off, I'd just like to say that I'm in Mensa and I'm constantly picked for juries in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell them. I'm an atheist, so I'm still constantly picked, just so you all know. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask was about your particular specialty, the evidence gathering. Are there best practices and standards that are applied, and how widely are they applied? Yeah, the, the, the biggest issue with, specifically with evidence collection, I'm a bagger and tagger, that's where my, my, my specialty is, is uh, preventing cr what we call cross-contamination. Um, carrying DNA evidence, because DNA te te evidence is extremely sensitive right now. I've, I've touched this, so my DNA is on here. So touch DNA, and there's enough of it on here to be, be testable. So the biggest challenge is, uh, 
is uh, preventing cross-contamination and from taking DNA from something a suspect might have touched to something they didn't or leaving your own DNA or having other officers put the DNA. And it's things like, like protocols, like changing gloves between collecting samples and, and things like that. But because these things haven't been studied and not standardized, um, that's not a standard practice across, across uh, departments and agencies and states and, and, and localities. And, you know, if you're, you're, okay, here's a good example. Say you interact with a suspect, and by interacting with that suspect, you've picked up part of that person's DNA. You can transfer that DNA to the scene if you're also working the scene. And, and then you can end up even with a DNA conviction based on, on faulty evidence collection practices. I think that's, that's our Probably last question. Probably all we got time for. I try to keep it on time because we have this little thing to do today. <laughs> all right, thank you very much.